sweet land of liberty, the 20th century brings you the most memorable moments in America's history. In this program, you'll learn about civil rights in America, the Great Depression and recovery, the atomic solution, suburbia and limit town, the space race, and the Cold War. America's struggle for civil rights goes far beyond any one group of people. The right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness belongs to all. Within the hundreds of years of history in America, women, Native Americans, and immigrants have all mounted a fight for equality. This story is merely one of many. It is the battle for freedom by the black American in the 20th century. The roots of that battle are based in the Portuguese, Spanish, and Dutch slave trading ships that brought Africans to America in the 17th century. Slavery long remained an issue between the northern and southern states of America, ending in a bloody conflict known as the War Between the States in 1861. President Abraham Lincoln enacted the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1, 1863, essentially freeing all slaves in the renegade Confederate states. A trio of amendments to the U.S. Constitution between 1865 and 1870, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, in essence abolished slavery, gave citizenship, and the right to vote to blacks. These preliminary steps to liberty were not taken without opposition. For example, even though the 15th Amendment provided black males with the right to vote, many Southern whites devised ways to deny the right such as literacy tests, which required blacks to read and understand the Constitution. Without education for almost all blacks up to that point, this served to unfairly disqualify them from voting. The grandfather law allowed blacks to vote if their slave ancestors had voted, which of course was an impossibility. The road to freedom was pitted with potholes. The southern states took their loss in the Civil War very hard and focused their anger on black citizens. In 1866, a former Confederate general named Nathan Forrest organized a band of thugs intent on terrorizing blacks in the South. This group, known as the Ku Klux Klan, or KKK, wore white hoods and robes. They rode white horses and brought fear to black communities in the South. While federal legislation put much of the Klan's activities to end by 1871, they reformed in 1915 and widened their base of hatred to include not only blacks, but also immigrants and any group they deemed as un-American. This prevailing prejudice against blacks led to the creation of local regulations in the South known as Jim Crow laws. These laws, usually designed to somehow skirt the federal civil rights laws, created an increased segregation of blacks from whites. Jim Crow laws kept blacks from using the same train station waiting rooms as whites, riding in the same railroad cars as whites, eating in the same restaurants as whites, even using the same washrooms and drinking fountains as whites. Segregation had long been the rule for America's national pastime, baseball. The modern game had been played since 1901, and no man of color had ever played Major League Ball. Black ball players played in the segregated Negro League, with top teams like the Chicago American Giants and the Homestead Grays. The stars of the league included Cool Papa Bell, Josh Gibson, and Rube Foster. The color line was finally broken in 1947 when Jackie Robinson, a four-sport star from UCLA, signed a contract to play for the Brooklyn Dodgers. His spirited play was never weakened by ugly racist comments from the crowds and even opponents on the field. He led the Dodgers to the National League pennant and was named Rookie of the Year. One wall had finally broken down. The struggle for education was hard fought as well. In 1896, the U.S. Supreme Court made a landmark decision in the case of Plessy v. Ferguson. They upheld that racial segregation was legal, as long as all parties were treated equally. Of course, equal was hardly ever the case. By 1954, the question of separate but equal was again raised in the case of Brown v. the Board of Education. A black girl in Topeka, Kansas was forced to travel several miles to school each day even though she literally lived next door to an all-white elementary school. This time, the Supreme Court stated that, quote, 
In the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Desegregation had begun, although some southern states avoided the ruling by privatizing their schools for whites only. In August of 1955, a 14-year-old black teen from Chicago named Emmett Till was visiting his grandfather in the tiny town of Money, Mississippi. While leaving a local grocery store, he either whistled or made a comment to the young white female cashier. Word of the incident spread quickly, and Till was grabbed by two men. They beat the young boy, shot him to death, and dumped him in a nearby river with a cotton gin fan tied around his neck. No arrests were made until the story appeared in a Chicago newspaper. Ray Bryant, the cashier's husband, and his half-brother, J.W. Millam, were put on trial before an all-white jury. Despite strong evidence, both were found innocent of the crime, although they later admitted to it in a magazine article. Meanwhile, Till's mother, Mamie Bradley, waked her son in an open coffin. I want all the world to see what they did to my son, she said. The world did, as pictures of the broken and bludgeoned boy appeared in a national magazine. It was a bleak moment for American civil rights. Rosa Parks was a 42-year-old black seamstress in Montgomery, Alabama. In December of 1955, she was riding the bus home when a white man demanded she get up and give her seat to him, as Jim Crow laws mandated. She quietly replied, Not today. Her feet were tired. She was arrested and the black community in Montgomery was outraged. Within a week, a boycott was called against the Montgomery bus service, which had a black ridership of nearly 70%. The boycott lasted more than a year before the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the ruling of a federal district court. Segregation on public transportation violated the 14th Amendment. The bus boycott had succeeded, led by a young black minister named Martin Luther King. Integration of public schools ran into more resistance. By the fall of 1957, only one out of four school districts in the South had begun to desegregate their schools. A federal court had ordered the desegregation of Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, and Governor Orville Faubus refused to comply. Angry white mobs blocked the school entrance and often became violent. President Dwight Eisenhower was forced to send in the 101st Airborne Division and put the local National Guard under the control of the federal government. Nine black students, known as the Little Rock Nine, attended Central High under the protection of the U.S. military. Four black college students entered a variety store in Greensboro, North Carolina in February of 1960. Even though the lunch counter was for whites only, they sat down and politely asked to be served. They weren't and remained seated until the store closed. When they left, they were still hungry. The next day, 31 blacks were seated at the lunch counter. None were served. The third day, more than 60 black students took part in what was now being called a sit-in. Soon, lunch counters all over the South became the site of sit-ins. When a group of protesters was arrested, another group would be ready to sit down and take their place. White business owners could hardly afford the negative publicity and loss of income, so they reluctantly began to serve anyone, black or white, who wanted a sandwich or a cup of coffee. The turning point for civil rights in America began in 1963. Once again, Birmingham, Alabama was the center of attention. Martin Luther King, now the leader of the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Council, came to a town that had been the scene of numerous bombings in black neighborhoods, as well as the Freedom Rider attacks. The continued plan of nonviolent resistance led to King's arrest and being placed in solitary confinement for eight days. While there, he wrote an essay on the black struggle for equality known as Letter from a Birmingham Jail. In part, he wrote, For years now, I have heard the word wait. This wait has almost always meant never. Upon his release, Dr. King chose children to continue the protests. His logic? Children could march, while the parents could work and take care of the family. The first day of protesting ended with almost a thousand kids aged 6 to 18 placed in jail. The next day, more than a thousand young people showed up at the local park to continue the march. Birmingham's Commissioner of Public Safety, named Bull Connor, ordered firefighters to turn high-pressure hoses on the crowd and sent canine dogs to break up the children. National television sent the gruesome pictures into the homes of America. As sit-ins and pickets continued, secret negotiations brought a victory for the SCLC. Much of the segregation in Birmingham would be abolished. <laughs> 
President Kennedy reacted by issuing a public call for equality in America. He followed up by introducing comprehensive civil rights legislation in Congress. In support of that bill, more than 250,000 Americans marched peacefully in Washington, D.C. on August 28. More than 75,000 were white. The march for civil rights started at the Washington Monument and ended at the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Once there, Dr. King delivered one of his most stirring speeches, known as I Have a Dream. I would simply like to say that I think this has been one of the great days of America. The assassination of JFK in fall of 1963 did not end the political drive for equal rights. Kennedy's successor, Lyndon Johnson, successfully passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the most comprehensive civil rights law ever passed in the U.S. Its wide reach prevented racial and gender discrimination in employment, voting, and the use of public facilities. But the new laws were still being evaded in many states and led to a continued sense of anger and disappointment in black America. In August of 1965, a black community of Los Angeles known as Watts became the scene of week-long violence following a traffic stop. When it was over, 34 were dead, over a thousand people were injured, nearly 4,000 were arrested, and hundreds of buildings were destroyed. Similar violence took place over the next two years in Newark, New Jersey, and Detroit, Michigan. Dr. King's philosophy of nonviolent resistance seemed to suit many black Americans. Others felt a need for a more militant approach. This division of beliefs brought alternatives like Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, and the Black Panthers to the spotlight. But the entire movement was dealt a tragic blow when Martin Luther King was shot and killed in April of 1968. His work for peaceful existence among all Americans was a constant crusade for liberty and justice for all. The decade of the Roaring Twenties in America was well named. It was wild, unpredictable, and out of control just like a savage lion that roars in the jungle for all to hear. Unfortunately, the decade ended with a country that was weak, toothless, and economically thrown into a cage called the Great Depression. The Great Depression is not a point in history that is easy to define. While it's true that the American stock market crashed in October of 1929, many events in the previous years contributed to the collapse. The distribution of income and wealth in America was uneven, Essentially, there was very little middle class in the 1920s. The top 1% of the American population held 45% of the American wealth, accounting for annual salaries of more than $50,000. It's important to remember that, in 1929, economists considered $2,500 to be the income necessary to support a family. More than 70% of the American population failed to reach that poverty line. When Herbert Hoover was elected in 1928, the soaring stock market was being carried largely by loans and brokers, in other words, speculative buying on credit. Hoover warned the New York Stock Exchange to keep a watchful eye on the increasing investing. He was ignored. Even conservative banks were making bad loans or investing recklessly. The American economy in the 1920s was based primarily on two industries, construction and automobiles. Although other industries like oil, chemicals, and plastics were beginning to grow, they couldn't offset the fall of house building and car buying. American farmers, long the backbone of the U.S. economy, were deeply in debt. Their farms were mortgaged to the limit, and crop prices were too low to help them pay off anything. The stage was then set for the economic collapse of America. On October 29, 1929, known as Black Tuesday, Stock prices rapidly dropped for a third time in one week. The stocks of many companies became virtually worthless, leaving the stockholders virtually penniless. Once proud and rich bread earners found themselves in giveaway bread lines and soup kitchens. The Great Depression had stunned much of America and the country was slow to respond. But the summer of 1932 saw a rising unrest in the land. One group to protest the economic status was the veterans of World War I, in 1924, Congress had promised a bonus of $1,000 to all who had served 
payable by 1945. But the ex-soldiers wanted it now, and more than 20,000 marched on the nation's capital to collect. Hoover and Congress refused and called out the city police to disperse the bonus army that had set up camps near the White House. Both sides sustained injuries, and Hoover was forced to resort to U.S. Army troops to clear the area. Led by the Army Chief of Staff named Douglas MacArthur, soldiers and tanks rolled down Pennsylvania Avenue to disperse the bonus marchers. The vets fled, and MacArthur ordered their tent city burned to the ground. The final tally was several veterans killed and more than 100 injured. It also signaled the end of Hoover's political career. New York Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a distant cousin to Teddy Roosevelt, defeated Hoover in a landslide. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. He took the presidential election in 1932 and set out to restore stability and confidence in the American government. One of his first tasks was to bring some sense and order to the American banking system. By 1933, many banks across the country were closing their doors as depositors withdrew their money in a panic. As soon as FDR took office in March, which is when the swearing-in ceremonies were held in those days, he called a four-day banking holiday. All American banks were closed while a special session of Congress addressed the financial crisis. They quickly passed the Emergency Banking Act and the Economy Act, both of which convinced Americans that it was safer to keep their money in a reopened bank than under the mattress. That reassurance was delivered directly to the American people by FDR with the new technology of radio. First developed as wireless telegraphy by Guglielmo Marconi around the turn of the century, AM, or amplitude modulated radio, became available to the public in 1920. Two years later, the first radio commercial was broadcast on New York's WEAF. It was a 10-minute spot for a realty company, and it cost $100. By the time Roosevelt had taken to the airwaves with his fireside chats in 1933, America could find some entertainment relief on the radio. Comedy was provided by Amos and Andy, the story of two blacks from Harlem, but ironically played by two white men, Freeman Gosden and Charles Carell. Live music came from the voices of singers like Rudy Valley, called the Vagabond Lover, and the orchestra of Guy Lombardo and his Royal Canadians. Radio stations sprouted up across the country as radio networks began to bloom, as General Electric, RCA, and Westinghouse formed the National Broadcasting Company in 1926 with nearly 50 stations. In some cities, NBC might have two competing stations, so they split into two networks, NBC Red and NBC Blue. The Blue Network would be sold to the American Broadcasting Company, known as ABC, during World War II. The Columbia Phonograph Record Company started the Columbia Broadcasting System in 1927, known as CBS. The motivation for getting into the business of radio broadcasting was obvious. All of the parent companies manufactured radios or records and could easily serve their own purposes by running radio networks as well. FDR approached the economic crisis as if he were entering a war. Congress had given him warlike powers to resurrect America. His first three and a half months in office, known as the Hundred Days, saw Roosevelt introducing a large number of bills. Almost all created alphabet soup agencies that would specifically focus on certain areas of need. This was Roosevelt's New Deal. The Agricultural Adjustment Administration, AAA, reduced crop production by farmers that ended the crop surplus and stopped the downward trend of farm prices. The National Recovery Administration, NRA, stimulated production and competition in American industries by regulating prices, industrial output, and general trade practices. The federal government agreed to enforce these practices, including the rights to organize unions and collectively bargain with management. So step out and give a man a job. You know who's in this in the NRA? No? Well, I'll tell you. And when I do, it'll give you harder trouble. The Civilian Conservation Corps, CCC, was a public works project operated under the control of the Army 
designed to promote environmental conservation while getting young, unemployed men off city street corners. The recruits planted trees, built wildlife shelters, stocked rivers and lakes with fish, and cleared beaches and campgrounds. The Tennessee Valley Authority, TVA, would build dams and power plants along the Tennessee River to bring electric power to rural areas in seven states. Some of the Great Depression's impact was due to natural causes. One of the worst droughts in history left a large portion of the Midwest and Plains in ruins. From Texas, the Dust Bowl stretched north into Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, and the Dakotas. The lack of rainfall combined with stifling hot temperatures to make the area bleak and barren. The drought lasted for almost a decade, finally coming to an end in 1941. FDR continued to introduce legislation in 1935 that would come to be known as the Second New Deal. The biggest component was the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, a program designed to bring employment opportunities to millions of Americans who needed jobs. WPA workers built or renovated more than 100,000 public buildings, including post offices, schools, and government offices. They built nearly 600 airports, over a half million miles of roads, and more than 100,000 bridges. The WPA also supported American arts and culture, paying unemployed writers, artists, musicians, and composers to do what they did best. But the economic fix was fragile and led to a recession by 1937. However, significant labor legislation was born in this period. The Wagner Act, also known as the National Labor Relations Act, provided workers with the right to form unions and bargain collectively with their management. The Fair Labor Standards Act was signed in 1938, creating a national minimum wage, a standard 40-hour work week, and restricting child labor in America. Franklin Roosevelt's New Deals did not end the Great Depression, but they did raise the U.S. government's awareness for social responsibility to its people. German scientists Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann took nuclear fission from concept to reality in December of 1938, supporting the efforts of the Nazi regime. Germany had taken control of Czechoslovakia and its rich supply of radioactive uranium ores, and, in doing so, placed itself in good position to develop an atomic bomb in very little time. Fission is the process of crashing a neutron into certain radioactive elements called isotopes, this collision causes the atom to break apart with a quick release of energy. The collision also releases more neutrons that crash into more atoms, creating what's known as a chain reaction. Scientists quickly learned that fission could create a great deal of energy, very destructive energy. While America was a full two years away from entering World War II, the fears of nuclear weapons throughout the scientific community quickly made their way to the American government. Hungarian physicists Leo Szilard and Edward Teller, along with Italian scientist Enrico Fermi, had done a great deal of nuclear experiments for America. In August of 1939, they convinced the world-famous physicist Albert Einstein to send a letter to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. In it, the letter warned of the great power of nuclear elements such as uranium and how Nazi Germany may have been very close to developing a nuclear weapon. It further suggested that the United States would be well advised to continue its support of its own efforts to develop nuclear energy and its use for making an atomic bomb. FDR took the letter to heart and accepted its content as a matter of extreme importance. He recommended immediate research for new uranium resources. When the U.S. entered the war in December of 1941 following the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, the urgency for atomic exploration increased even more. By September of 1942, the United States had started a highly secret program to develop an atomic bomb. It was called the Manhattan Project. Several locations across America were selected to develop certain portions of the project, all under the watchful eye of Army General Leslie Groves. The University of Chicago was picked for developing a chain reaction of radioactive elements. Italian physics expert and Nobel Prize winner Enrico Fermi headed up the project in Chicago. On December 2, 1942, in a makeshift lab underneath the bleachers of the UFC football stadium, 
Fermi and his team achieved the first self-sustained nuclear chain reaction. High in the hills of New Mexico, the town of Los Alamos was chosen to be the design center for the atomic bomb. J. Robert Oppenheimer, a physics professor from California, was selected as director of the project. The job of his team was to design a weapon small enough to be carried and deployed by airplane. The town of Oak Ridge, Tennessee, near Knoxville, became the plant responsible for developing refined uranium. Hanford, in Washington state, took control of plutonium production. Estimates place the total number of Americans working on the development of the atomic bomb at nearly 100,000 by 1945. Very few actually knew what they were working on. In May of 1945, Germany had been split in fighting U.S. and British troops from the west and Soviet troops from the east. Shortly after the suicide of Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler, Germany surrendered. But Japan fought on. FDR had died suddenly in April of 1945, placing Vice President Harry Truman in the Oval Office. By the middle of summer, the first actual test of the atomic bomb was ready. While Truman met with England's Prime Minister Winston Churchill and Soviet leader Joseph Stalin at the Potsdam Conference in Germany, the test bomb called Trinity was detonated at Alamogordo, New Mexico. Nothing like it had ever been seen before. The blast was equivalent to more than 18,000 tons of TNT. It turned the sand around the detonation point to glass and knocked over a 200-ton steel container a half mile away. Truman had a tough decision to make. He knew that the Japanese were committed to a fight to the finish. Also, Russia had agreed to declare war on Japan and would join U.S. and British military in an enormous invasion of the Japanese port of Kyushu. Dropping the bomb would, in the long run, save hundreds of thousands of American lives. It would also serve as a warning to the less than trustworthy Stalin that America now possessed the most deadly weapon in the world. But Truman also feared for the loss of civilian lives. Truman had determined that the target for the atomic bomb must be military, and that the Japanese should receive a final warning, which was issued on July 26th. The Potsdam Proclamation, as it was known, advised Japan to surrender unconditionally or face prompt and utter destruction. The Japanese ignored the ultimatum. On August 6, 1945, a B-29 bomber nicknamed the Enola Gay dropped a five-ton uranium bomb called Little Boy because of its thin design, on the city of Hiroshima. Although it had important military significance, it also had a population of 300,000 people. The blast killed 70,000, injured 70,000 more. It flattened an area of five square miles. Once again, Truman asked the Japanese government to surrender. Again, they refused. On August 9th, another B-29 bomber named Boxcar dropped a five-ton plutonium bomb called Fat Man on Nagasaki, a center for torpedo manufacturing and home to more than 170,000 people. This time, 40,000 died and another 60,000 were injured. Within a week, Japan surrendered and the Second World War had ended. The aftermath of using the atomic bomb the so-called atomic solution, was so devastating, nuclear weapons have never been used since for war. American soldiers returned to their homes in 1945 after the end of World War II, but while they may have been triumphant, they also faced the challenge of once again becoming part of peacetime America, and that wasn't always easy. To aid their re-entrance to society, President Franklin Roosevelt had signed the GI Bill in June of 1944. Officially known as the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, the bill was designed to provide a variety of opportunities to returning war veterans. The act gave assistance in the areas of health care, buying homes, and education, which was the main focus of the action. 
Returning soldiers could attend the college of their choice while the government paid for their tuition, books, any other fees, and even housing. Within seven years, more than eight million veterans had received educational support through the GI Bill, as the government paid out nearly $14 billion. The GI Bill, along with enormous amounts of money Americans were able to save during the war, provided the basis for one of the most amazing periods of economic growth and prosperity in American history. As the United States had entered the 20th century, its population was clearly divided among the rural farms and urban cities. Economically speaking, Americans were either rich upper class or poor lower class. However, the increased population and prosperity following the war created a new class in the late 1940s, the middle class, and they carved out their own spot all over the American map. It was called suburbia. The birthplace of suburbia can most likely be placed on Long Island, New York, where William Levitt, himself a returning war vet, began building affordable housing for other homecoming soldiers. The development became known as, appropriately enough, Levittown, and it was a big hit. By the end of 1947, more than 2,000 houses had been built and occupied. By mid-1948, the company of Levitt and Sons was building 30 homes a day. The homes were cookie-cutter by design. No basement, no garage, pre-cut lumber. But buyers still had their choice of five different models. The homes came equipped with a stove and refrigerator, a stainless steel sink, kitchen cabinets, and a washing machine. By 1949, a Levitt ranch house could be purchased for about $8,000, $90 down and $58 a month, and with the aid of a GI loan. The success of William Levitt put his face on the cover of Time magazine in July of 1950. Levittown, New York, with its homes, schools, and shopping, became the model for suburban subdivisions across the country. And when the last house in Levittown was purchased in 1951, more than 17,000 homes had been built in the development, the largest single subdivision in America. Many of the homes in suburbia began sprouting strange metal skeletons from their roofs. They were antennas. Antennas for televisions. Although development of TV had begun in the 1920s and 30s, research and manufacturing resources were redirected toward the war effort in the 1940s. The growth of television was as explosive as Levittown. In 1947, America produced just over 175,000 TV sets. By 1950, the annual production had increased to an incredible 7,460,000 TVs. The Korean War curtailed production slightly, but the wonder of the glowing glass tube had taken hold of America. Television programming was diverse. Douglas Edwards began a regularly scheduled news report for CBS in May of 1947, the first in the country. Living rooms were soon filled with the sights and sounds of boxing, roller derby, and professional wrestling. Meals and homework were planned around the TV antics of comedians like Jack Benny and his curvy guest Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn. Marilyn, I know this is sudden, but will you, will you marry me? Marry you? But look at the difference, difference in our ages. Well, there isn't much difference, Marilyn. You're 25 and I'm 39. <laughs> Yes, but what about 25 years from now, when I'm 50 and you're 39? <laughs> Gee, I never thought of that. I did. You shut up! <laughs> By the end of the decade, American suburban lives were reflected in television icons like Ozzie and Harriet. Say, I have an idea. Why don't you come along with me this evening? Oh. Yeah, I, I don't know. There are a lot of interesting people at the sketch class. I think it's just the thing you've been looking for. Yeah, the, uh, maybe you're right. Uh, sounds like a pretty good idea. Uh, what do I need? A piece of paper, a steady hand, and your glasses. Come on. <laughs> okay, I'll get my coat. The advent of television had cut deeply into the American pastime of movie-going. In 1947, nearly 60% of the American population went to the movies on a weekly basis. By 1953 that figure had dropped to only 25%. Hollywood responded to the threat with gimmicks. Three-dimensional films, or 3D, attempted to bring the movies right into the lap of the audience. In 
Wanted Devil was the first feature, released in November of 1952. It didn't make much of an impact on America, but House of Wax did. Released in April of 1953, the horror film was a box office smash, taking in five and a half million dollars. the opening soon of the most astounding motion picture since motion pictures began. Other 3D films, like The Creature from the Black Lagoon, weren't as successful, and 3D was dead by the mid-1950s. Many of the films from the 1950s dealt with strange beings visiting from outer space, which was fed by the curious sighting phenomenon of unidentified flying objects, UFOs. The issue was serious enough for the Department of the Air Force to begin Project Sign in 1948 to investigate these sightings. In 1953, the name was changed to Project Blue Book. While the Air Force investigated all reports, it was hard to tell if they were looking for an invasion from another planet or from the Russian communists. Project Blue Book was not so much a search for extraterrestrials as it was a boost for national security. In all, Project Blue Book took in more than 12,000 sightings in its 22-year existence. Just over 700 were actually determined to be unidentified. But the matter of UFOs being piloted by intelligent creatures was never proven. The growth of suburbia increased the need for personal transportation. Many cities had buses and trains for mass transportation, but the country did not have the roads that were now needed to connect the cities and suburbs with others. President Dwight Eisenhower signed the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956 on June 29th, calling for more than 41,000 miles of interstate highways at a cost of more than $25 billion. It would be the biggest public works project in American history. The interest in highways and roads matched America's interest in the automobile. In 1945, only two out of three American households had a car. By 1960, nine out of ten had one. As personal transportation grew, public transportation shrank. In 1945, 35% of the U.S. used public transportation on a regular basis. By 1960, only 7% used it. Car manufacturers in Detroit responded to America's need for speed with unique designs in automobiles. Chevrolet introduced the Corvette sports car in 1953, calculated to compete with the Jaguar and MG from Europe. Although the first model offered a modest 150 horsepower, the engine was beefed up to nearly 300 horsepower by 1958. The Chevy Corvette was hand-built and sported a sleek fiberglass body. The Ford Motor Company responded to the Corvette threat by introducing the Thunderbird in 1955. A two-seat sports car like its Chevy rival, the Thunderbird sold more than 16,000 units in its first year. By 1958, it became a four-seater and was considered one of America's first personal luxury cars. If you wanted to come close to breaking the sound barrier, you could order your Thunderbird with a monster 350 horsepower engine. Not all of the designs from Detroit were winners. Ford created the Edsel Division in 1957, named after the son of company founder Henry Ford, and introduced the Edsel for 1958. Even though the country was in a period of economic recession, two and a half million potential buyers went to their local car showroom to see the Edsel. Not many drove out. The Edsel was big, gaudy, and not very attractive. It stopped production in 1960 after selling only 110,000 cars. The Edsel soon became an icon for failure. Yet, the decade of the 1950s still remained one of unparalleled growth and progress in American history. <laughs> 
America actually began its reach for space in 1926, when Dr. Robert Goddard launched a small liquid-fueled rocket in a field in Auburn, Massachusetts. His work continued into the 1930s and dovetailed into the efforts of Dr. Werner von Braun, who had developed the V-1 and V-2 rockets for Nazi Germany during the Second World War. After the war, von Braun came to America with his team of German rocket scientists to spearhead the development of America's rocket and space program. In the late 40s and 50s, they sent more than 60 V-2s into the skies over the proving grounds of White Sands, New Mexico. While the specter of communism loomed in the distance, America continued developing missile boosters called ICBMs, Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles. These rockets were capable of delivering large payloads over long distances. They would be America's first line of defense in the event of an attack from Russia, the fear of many Americans in the 1950s. The Russians had similar high-powered boosters for similar purposes. America's two workhorses were the Redstone and the Atlas. Nearing the end of the 50s, military initiatives grew into scientific programs. Russia astounded the world by launching a satellite into orbit around the Earth on October 4, 1957. The baby moon, as the media called it, was known as Sputnik. It meant fellow traveler, although it was alone in space. Although Sputnik was designed to perform scientific measurements of the atmosphere, the implications were clear. The Russians now had a military foothold on the reaches of outer space. America responded nearly four months later, following numerous launch pad disasters, by successfully launching its first satellite called Explorer 1 on January 31, 1958. The space race had begun. Congress acted quickly, creating the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, known as NASA, in mid-1958. Their primary mandate was to place a man into space and safely bring him back. By April of 1959, they had selected seven military test pilots to become America's first spacemen, the Mercury astronauts. While the intentions in the quest for space were largely scientific, there was no doubt that the Cold War was the underlying motivation for success. The Russians again struck first, launching cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin into Earth orbit on April 12, 1961. America answered back with the launch of Alan Shepard on May 5th, less than a month later. The Redstone booster took his Freedom 7 Mercury spacecraft into space on a 16-minute suborbital flight. Less than three weeks later, President Kennedy raised the ante substantially by committing America to landing a man on the moon before the end of the decade. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The Russians had made their intentions of landing a man on the moon known within the USSR back in 1956, but seemed to lack a defined sense of direction. In the meantime, America forged ahead with a unified effort to reach the moon by 1970. The Mercury program taught the astronauts about the effects of weightlessness and the mechanics of getting into space and getting out of it safely. John Glenn rode atop an Atlas booster in his Friendship 7 spacecraft on February 20, 1962, becoming the first American to orbit the Earth. The Gemini program started in 1965 and again relied on an ICBM booster, this time the Titan. Gemini gave NASA the chance to spend longer periods of time in space, as well as the ability for astronauts to exit the spacecraft and maneuver in space. It also allowed the astronauts to practice the tasks of rendezvous and docking, the ability to chase and physically connect to another spacecraft. This facet was crucial to getting America to the moon, which would be the job of Project Apollo. In the race to the moon, America suffered its first casualties as Virgil Gus Grissom, Ed White and Roger Chaffee were killed in a ground test of the Apollo 1 spacecraft in January of 1967. The Apollo program redesigned the craft and proceeded to aim for the moon. Using the massive Saturn V booster designed specifically for the moon launch, four Apollo missions prepared NASA and America for the historic flight in July of 1969. Astronauts Neil Armstrong and Edwin Buzz Aldrin separated their lunar lander, nicknamed Eagle, from Michael Collins in Columbia, the command module. As America held its breath, the lunar module, or LEM, made its way toward the surface of the moon. 
It was July 20th, 1969. Contact right. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. JFK's legacy was realized when Neil Armstrong stepped off the ladder of the Lem and became the first human to set foot on a terrestrial object other than the Earth. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Although Russia had taken an early lead, America showed the staying power and commitment to win the space race. When World War II came to an end, the Allied countries of the United States, Great Britain, France, and Russia had defeated the Axis countries of Germany, Japan, and Italy. But it was clear there were no real winners. Millions of lives had been lost, and billions of dollars had been spent on all sides. One of the first steps taken to prevent another world war was the creation of the United Nations in 1945. Its purpose was to encourage global cooperation in cases of law, human and civil rights, security, economy, and world peace. Fifty-one countries in the world originally joined, including the U.S., Great Britain, the Soviet Union, China, Australia, parts of Africa and the Middle East, and much of South America, among others. At the same time, the heads of America, England, and Russia, President Harry Truman, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and General Secretary Joseph Stalin met in the German city of Potsdam. Their mission was to determine how they could best assist Europe to rebuild from the terrible effects of the war. It was decided Germany, and its capital of Berlin, would be broken up into four areas, with each allied country assigned to aid a specific section. France, Great Britain and America took western portions, with the Soviets taking the eastern portion. But the partnership between the Allies was not a strong one. The group felt that Russia and their leaders couldn't be trusted. France, England, and the U.S. had free and open governments. But Russia's was based on communism, the belief that all property, like land, food, houses, transportation and the power to make decisions all belong equally to everyone. The reality at that time was Russia and its communist government was very powerful and kept a tight control over its population, much like a dictatorship. What's more, they intended to spread their dominating beliefs into Europe and perhaps further. In a 1946 speech by Winston Churchill, the Brit used the phrase, the Iron Curtain, to describe how Europe had become divided by the spread of communism. An example in 1948 was in Berlin, where the Soviet-occupied eastern portion became isolated from the others in the West. The Soviets blocked all travel and supplies from their part of the city into the rest of Berlin, attempting to starve its inhabitants and force the other countries to leave the city entirely. They refused and began the Berlin Airlift, dropping 5,000 tons of food and other supplies every day to the people of West Berlin. The attempted blockade lasted nearly a year before it failed completely. Eventually, Europe became what Churchill had feared, a continent divided by the Iron Curtain, with free countries like the U.S., Canada, France, Great Britain, Italy, and others belonging to NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and countries under communist rule like the Soviet Union, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and others becoming members of the Warsaw Pact. Germany was split, with West Germany as part of NATO and East Germany part of the Warsaw Pact. Fearing that more of Europe would fall under the grip of communism, two programs were developed. The first was the Truman Doctrine in 1947 which offered economic and military help to Greece and Turkey. The second was the Marshall Plan in 1948, with the U.S. pumping $13 billion into the rebuilding of war-torn Europe. 
the results were largely successful as those involved joined NATO in the 1950s. These events from the war's end to the early 1950s started what became known as the Cold War. English author George Orwell, who wrote novels like 1984 and Animal Farm, first used the phrase in a 1945 essay. He suggested that, with terrible devices like the atomic bomb, future wars might not be ones fought with weapons, but with words and beliefs. The winner of the Cold War would control the losers, like master and slaves. America concluded the best defense against the Cold War was not with guns, but something called containment, an idea suggested in 1946 by a U.S. diplomat named George Kennan. In 1950, a secret document known as National Security Council Report No. 68, or NSC 68, outlined the steps needed for containment by the U.S. government. It included increasing military budgets, developing more weapons, including nuclear arms like the hydrogen bomb in 1952, to defend America and its NATO allies from potential Soviet attacks, who by now had developed the atomic bomb as well, and a general increase in scientific research and technology. If communism could not be stopped, perhaps it could be contained to the areas where it already existed. Unfortunately, the first test for containment did include conventional weapons, as America and many of the United Nations were challenged by the Korean War. In 1950, South Korea was invaded by communist North Korea and their leader, Kim Il-sung, backed by the Soviets and China, which, led by Mao Zedong, had become a communist power in 1949. Part of the containment strategy was to stop the spread of communism, so more than 300,000 international soldiers assisted South Korea in its fight. The conflict came to a close three years later with an agreement to cease fire and the establishment of a demilitarized or safe zone called the DMZ between North and South Korea. The son and grandson of Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un, have continued the North Korean commitment to communism. More recently, they have threatened the safety of South Korea and the rest of the world, more than 60 years after the end of the war. The threat of communism reached the shores of America in the early 1950s. For example, Joseph McCarthy, a U.S. senator from the state of Wisconsin, stirred the fears of commies under the bed with a virtual witch hunt of supposed communists in American government. In 1950, he claimed to have a list of more than 200 members of the U.S. State Department who belonged to the American Communist Party. Completely false, the claim still drew attention to McCarthy and his reckless crusade for communists. Eventually, McCarthy led a Senate subcommittee investigating potential communists in the U.S. Army in 1954. President Dwight Eisenhower, a former five-star Army general and a major leader in World War II, was not at all happy with the accusing senator. With the relatively new medium of television providing non-stop coverage, McCarthy's grandstanding and careless accusations turned the American public against him. Let us not assassinate this lad further, Senator. Let's, let's, You've done enough. Have first. you no sense of decency, sir? At long last, have you left no sense of decency? McCarthy was soon condemned by the Senate, ignored by the press and the public, and died from complications associated with alcohol abuse in 1957. Despite McCarthy's pursuit of many innocent Americans, the fact remained that communism threatened our country. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, taking over when Stalin died in 1953, famously claimed to Western diplomats in 1956, We will bury you. While he was referring to the fact that the ideas of communism would eventually win out against capitalism and democracy, many people believed his threat involved using a shovel to physically put Americans in cemeteries. The possibility of a foreign invasion on U.S. soil led to the creation of civil defense programs, including mass evacuation plans, emergency alert systems, 
and education campaigns that included a cartoon character named Bert the Turtle, who encouraged kids to quickly duck and cover if they ever saw the flash of an atomic bomb blast. Remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? Many Americans also built fallout shelters in their backyards, stocking them with large supplies of food and water in the event of a nuclear attack. Also, many public buildings were identified as public fallout shelters, although experts today believe they would have provided little protection in the case of an actual atomic bomb blast. The chilly Cold War between America and the Soviet Union would continue to rage through the 1950s and beyond. The Cold War between the U.S. and Russia, a conflict that pitted democracy against communism, showed no signs of slowing down during the 1960s. The government of the Caribbean island of Cuba, less than 100 miles from the state of Florida, was taken over in a revolution in 1959. With leader Fidel Castro in power, communism quickly became the policy of the land. Economic support came from the Soviet Union, who looked at the small island as a possible stepping stone to America. Several major events in the 1960s added fuel to the Cold War. In early 1961, President John F. Kennedy reluctantly approved a secret plan already started by the previous administration. The CIA, America's Central Intelligence Agency, was a government agency of secret agents and spies that was started in 1947 at the beginning of the Cold War. The agency had trained more than 1,000 Cubans who had fled their country when Castro took power with the idea of invading the island and taking it back from the communist leader. The Bay of Pigs invasion, called that because it was the spot on the island where the secret troops would land, turned out to be a huge failure for the CIA and America. Castro and his soldiers knew the invasion was coming and easily defeated the attackers. More than 1,200 ex-Cubans were taken prisoner, while President Kennedy and America were embarrassed around the world. Nearly two years later, Kennedy traded more than $53 million in food and medical supplies to Cuba in exchange for the prisoners' freedom. The German city of Berlin, divided into east and west portions after World War II, became even more isolated in the early 1960s. Living conditions in the two sectors were greatly different. The West, supported by the Allied countries of America, England, and France, was quite comfortable and flourished under a democratic structure. On the other hand, the East was ruled with an iron hand by communist Russia, and its inhabitants were not happy. By 1961, more than two and a half million East Berliners had fled to the western portion of the city. This had to stop. Overnight, on August 13, 1961, the Soviets erected a barbed wire fence between East and West Berlin. Within a few weeks, a concrete barrier was added, and the Berlin Wall now physically isolated the people of East Berlin from the West. Anyone attempting to climb or cross the wall was immediately shot by armed guards. Eventually, the wall would be 12 feet high and 4 feet thick. Nearly two years later, President Kennedy spoke before a crowd of nearly 50,000 West Berlin citizens. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner. The German phrase, Ich bin ein Berliner, meant I am a Berliner, and showed West Germans and the Soviets how he and the rest of the world stood against communism. JFK would face off against the Russians in late 1962, with the world coming to the brink of a nuclear war. As part of the Russian response to the failed Bay of Pigs invasion, Premier Khrushchev turned to his ally, President Fidel Castro, in Cuba, and offered to install several missile launch sites on the island nation. At the time, America was using a high-flying spy plane known as the U-2. A flyover in October 1962 
confirmed the missile installations were underway. JFK was informed of the threat, and he assembled a committee of his top advisors, including his younger brother Bobby, who was the Attorney General. The group, known as XCOM, discussed and debated over various responses to the threat that was now less than 100 miles from American soil. Everyone agreed that the Cuban missile installations could not be allowed to exist, and something had to be done quickly, before they were completed. Part of XCOM wanted to try negotiating the removal of the sites. Some suggested doing nothing, while the military members wanted to mount an attack against the installations, which might escalate to another world war. Kennedy believed none of those solutions would work. Meanwhile, at the United Nations, U.S. Ambassador Adlai Stevenson posed a very simple question to the Soviet. Please is over. Is that your decision? Showing great diplomacy, the president asked the U.S. Navy to enforce a quarantine of the island, an action that fell short of warlike aggressiveness, but still effective by blocking any Russian ships from delivering more military supplies to Cuba. He then took to American television barely a week after the spy plane confirmed the Cuban missile sites. He told everyone about the missiles, the country's actions, and the clear fact that America was prepared to use military force, if needed, against Cuba and the Soviets, if the missiles were not removed immediately. The situation was tense, and then the tension increased. As two Russian ships approached the group of U.S. Navy vessels that blocked their paths, A U-2 plane on a mission was shot down over Cuba. The pilot was killed in the crash, and the U.S. prepared to invade the island. There seemed to be no way out for either superpower. Behind the scenes, Khrushchev let it be known that he would remove the Cuban missiles if America promised not to invade Cuba. A second message offered to dismantle the sites if America removed similar missile sites from the country of Turkey which was very close to Russian borders. Seeming to be a confused set of messages, the XCOM merely decided to accept the first offer and totally ignore the second, although the U.S. would eventually take down the Turkish missiles. The crisis was over. Facing the brink of destruction, those fighting the Cold War may have warmed up just a slight bit. The Southeast Asian country of Vietnam had been a colony of France since the 1850s, but became divided into North and South Vietnam after World War II. Communist China supported the North, whose regime was in the city of Hanoi, while the U.S. supported South Vietnam and its government in Saigon. By the 1960s, Vietnam was a country split between communist and democratic beliefs, much like Korea. Many observers considered the conflict as a civil war to be decided strictly between them alone. Others, including the U.S., saw the Vietnam conflict as another need for containment. While America had placed a small number of support troops in South Vietnam, a seemingly minor skirmish in the mid-60s turned into a major military involvement for the United States. In August of 1964, a U.S. Navy ship was attacked by three North Vietnamese patrol boats while in international waters near North Vietnam. The small boats were no match for the destroyer and were quickly turned away by gunfire. The incident wasn't even mentioned by the U.S. President, Lyndon Johnson, often called LBJ, and his administration. But a second attack, two days later, resulted in Congress passing the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which allowed LBJ to take military action without the official declaration of war. No matter, the U.S. was now in battle with North Vietnam. Sadly, official U.S. documents released in 2005 revealed there actually had been no second attack as reported. In the eight-plus years that followed, ground fighting and airstrikes in the Vietnam War cost the U.S. a staggering $120 billion. More importantly, more than 500,000 Americans were sent into battle. More than 58,000 never came home. The war also resulted in a wide division among Americans. Many staged anti-war protests, including the deadly student demonstration in 1970 at Ohio's Kent State University. Hardly peaceful, 
four students were killed and nine others injured by gunfire from National Guard troops trying to break up the gathering. It seemed that America had declared war against itself. Another result of the Vietnam War showed that America, still a superpower, was not invincible. In their campaign for containment, the U.S. had become tied up in a war that they could not win. A peace treaty signed in Paris in early 1973 ended America's involvement, and in 1975, North Vietnamese troops took over Saigon. Vietnam was unified the next year and essentially remains a communist country today. A series of meetings and treaties between America and the Soviet Union during the 1970s established a new look at how democracy and communism could exist peacefully in the same world. Called détente, it was a French word that meant relaxation. A meeting in 1975 resulted in the Helsinki Accords, where 35 nations, including the U.S., Canada, the USSR, and much of Europe, agreed to improve the relationships between communist and non-communist countries. Many of the treaties surrounded the reduction of the stockpile of nuclear weapons that had been built by the two superpowers over the years. Known as SALT-1 and SALT-2, the agreements were reached in 1972 and 1979. Much of the American and Russian manned space programs in the 1960s, the space race, was an example of how the Cold War had been fought. In an example of detente, the two nations developed the Apollo-Soyuz test program, ASTEP, that allowed a spacecraft from each country to dock in space, while astronauts and cosmonauts worked together on scientific and research projects. The age of detente came to an end in 1979, as the Soviets waged war in Afghanistan. They provided support to the communist Afghan government, fighting against anti-communist, freedom-fighting Muslims in the country, known as the Mujahideen, supported by the U.S. and other Western countries. To stop the rebellion, Russia brought 100,000 troops into the country, but were not very successful. By 1989, they decided to pull out of Afghanistan completely. During the 1980s, it appeared that the Cold War of nearly 40 years had begun to chip away at the Soviet Union. Their economy suffered and politics became splintered. Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev began to encourage openness and a new democratic policy for his country. U.S. President Ronald Reagan encouraged Gorbachev to go all the way. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. In East Germany, checkpoints to cross the border began to open up. On November 9, 1989, Following an official announcement that completely opened up the border between East and West Germany, citizens began to break down the Berlin Wall with sledgehammers and other tools. Within the year, the two countries of East and West Germany reunified into the single nation of Germany. In 1991, the Soviet Union broke itself apart to become the Commonwealth of Independent States, CIS, 12 republics that signaled the finish of the Cold War. While communist governments continue to exist today, they no longer pose the threat to world peace and harmony that existed during the more than 40 years of the Cold War.